Hi everyone, welcome to Wilkin and Current Plan's uh, next edition of webinars for the CIRA industry. Our exciting topic today is New Jersey sales tax and use tax for associations and overview. I'm sure you guys can't wait. All right, let's be realistic. It's not really that exciting a topic, but the people that I have with me are going to make it very exciting. My name is Mohammed Saliani. I'm a principal here at Wilkin and Garden Plan. And our two excellent speakers for today are Len Nitti, who is a guru on tax. He's been with us for 18 years. And personally, I think he probably knows more tax than a lot of IRS agents out there. Uh, then we also have Carol Kransky, who is a wizard at uh, audits and uh, tech stuff as far as audits are concerned. She's been with us for 23 years. and. I can tell you she knows a lot about audits. So moving on, housekeeping rules before we start the, uh, the webinar. To ask any questions, please use the questions pane in the GoWebinar dashboard on your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. And if we do not get to your question, then we will get back to you after the webinar. Throughout the webinar, we will have a few polling questions. This will help us get a sense of the webinar participants and their experience. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website at www.wgcpas.com. So here's one of our polling questions. New Jersey CIRAs are not subject to sales tax since they are incorporated as not-for-profit corporations. True, false, only condominium and homeowner associations are only co-ops. Please go ahead and answer. All right, we'll give you a few more seconds. All right. So, uh, 78% said false and 22% said that's true. And so they are subject to sales tax because they are not considered not-for-profit organizations here in New Jersey. All right, so we'll move on. I think, Len, you can go from here. Yep, and I'm glad most people did uh, answer false as this would have been a pretty quick webinar if there were no sales and use tax considerations. Um, and even though a, a CIRA, especially the, the condos, are organized as not-for-profit corporations, to be exempt from sales tax, you have to be a public charity or a 501c3 organization. So even though a, a CIRA is typically organized as a tax or not-for-profit entity, um, they are still subject to sales and use tax. So we're going to start really basic and just talk about what sales and use tax is. Um, sales tax is essentially a transactional tax, and it's a tax on certain property and services that are designated as taxable by New Jersey, um, and it is collected by the seller at the point of sale. Use tax is essentially the exact opposite of sales tax, or the inverse of sales tax, in that use tax applies to taxable purchases where the seller didn't collect sales tax at the point of sale. Um, there are certain scenarios where, or situations we'll talk a little bit about later, where a seller is not required to collect sales tax on behalf of New Jersey. And when that happens, the association then becomes responsible for use tax. And a lot of the New Jersey audits um, for tax purposes end up focusing on use tax because where a seller typically doesn't comply with collecting sales tax, mostly the associations don't realize that it's their responsibility to pay through use tax. So some general rules on sales tax. Um, purchases of tangible personal property are typically subject to sales tax unless the state provides a specific exemption like clothing or milk or other types of food. Those are specifically exempt tangible personal property. Um, purchases of services are typically not subject to sales and use tax unless specifically identified as taxable. And we're going to give a number of examples throughout the presentation on what are service going to be subject to sales and use tax. It's also important to note that the accrual method is used for sales and use tax purposes. So if the association is selling any services or products that are deemed to be taxable, um, they're going to have to pay the tax whether or not they've collected it from the unit owners yet. 
Um, and it's also required that sales tax be separately stated on any invoices that are issued. Let so I'm going to turn it over to... Let's go back one, one sure. second. Go back to the slide. So your last bullet point, you know, we talk about sales tax must be separately stated on the invoice. A lot of times vendors will give an invoice that says price includes sales tax. So what do you, what's your opinion on that? There are certain types of sales that can be, that can be done with being inclusive of sales tax, but it really should be separately stated. Um, you know, the, the state could come in and audit that vendor and could, could assess them tax if they haven't done this properly, but it is, it is required that they separately state it. Um, certain type, very specific types of sales don't need to include sales tax. It could be asterisk and, and identified, uh, but typically the general rule is they have to be separately stated. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to Carol to talk about capital improvements and repairs and maintenance. Okay, so we've talked about the sales tax and so some items are potentially not subject to sales tax and that's if the state deems that it's a capital improvement. So what's a capital improvement? Um, a capital improvement is the installation of tangible personal property which increases the value or the life of the real property. And um, something to consider in determining whether or not um, this would even qualify, it must be permanently affixed to the real property, the land or the building. So it's important that, um, you know, anything that you're installing, that it actually be affixed, not just loose and, and brought into the building. So. If the contract is considered a capital improvement, it may be exempt from sales tax. And we're going to talk about later when we talk about con constitutes a capital improvement as to who has the final determination in that. So labor on capital improvements is exempt from sales tax. The parts and materials for capital improvements are exempt if they're provided by the contractor that's performing the installation. If the parts and material are purchased from somebody else, then they are subject to sales tax. So for example, if the association goes to Home Depot and purchases roof tile and brings the roof tile back to the clubhouse and then has the contractor install those roof tiles, well, those parts and materials, because they were not purchased from the contractor, would be subject to sales tax and the association would have had to pay the sales tax when they bought the tiles from Home Depot. So some examples of capital improvements, and you're going to see one word that keeps being repeated throughout this listing. New roof, new siding, paving of a driveway, new fence, new doors, new elevator, new hot water heater, um, also new air conditioning system, new heating system, things of that nature would be considered capital improvements. Um, and we've emphasized new in here is because something that's new, so therefore it's an improvement and it raises the value and it has a longer life as opposed to just repairing something. So when you have a new fence, you know, you didn't just nail a couple of um, pieces of wood on to make the fence partially new, but you have a new fence, so therefore it's better than it was before. And that's kind of what you want to think about in determining if something's a capital improvement. So we talked about the capital improvement that it in, um, improves the value and increases the value. If something's a repair, then that just maintains the value. So if you're just repairing something, you know, you're putting, instead of the roof and, you know, not doing a whole roof, but maybe you're doing 10% of the roof or you're just fixing the roof tiles that came off during a recent storm, well, that would be considered a repair. It's just maintaining the existing value. You didn't better the property. So when it's a repair, now the labor is subject to sales tax, whereas before in an improvement, the labor was not subject. Parts and materials are not subject to tax if separately stated on the invoice. 
parts and materials not purchased from the contractor are subject to the sales tax. And maintenance contracts are subject to sales tax. Um, and examples of maintenance contracts, things that uh, lawn maintenance, um, grounds maintenance, snow maintenance contracts, those are all subject to sales tax. Um, we've had associations that have a, a contract with a vendor just for general uh, maintenance and you know, cleaning, sweeping, and, and maintaining uh, the property. And those monthly payments are absolutely subject to sales tax. So it's important to know what they're doing and that the contract, if it's for maintenance plus items that could be capital improvements, you'd want to know that those are separately stated out. Yeah, if I could jump in one second, Carol, mm -hmm. just so there's no confusion as to why sometimes the parts and materials are subject to tax and sometimes they're not, the state of New Jersey looks to who they deem to be the end user of the parts and materials. And in the case of um, when you're using a contractor, the contractor is deemed to be the end user and they are paying sales tax on all of the parts and materials. That's why the association does not need to pay tax on them again. Whereas if you're purchasing it directly from a third party, um, like a Home Depot, as Carol gave the example, the association is the one that's ultimately purchasing those directly from the seller. Um, and that's why they are becoming subject to sales tax. Someone always pays a sales tax. It's just a question of who it is. Right, good point, Len. Okay. Um, and here's some other examples of repairs and maintenance. So we talked about the fixing leaky roof, uh, patching driveway potholes. Obviously, just patching some potholes is significantly different than a new driveway. Um, replacing torn screen as opposed to putting all new windows in. Pointing of bricks, uh, repair of the hot water heater, um, and repairing gutters. So sometimes someone will say, okay, well, I'm repairing that hot water heater, so now it has a longer life. So why isn't that considered a capital improvement? What do you think? The state takes the position that you're just restoring it to its original working order. Even though you're technically ex extending the life of it, it's no different. It's operating no differently than it was when you originally purchased it. So it's important to think about what you're doing and how does that fit in. Yeah. So Carol, I have a question that came in. Um, what if the item I'm purchasing has been included in the engineering study? Okay, so <clears throat> it's a good question for those um, people that are saying, all right, well, if it's in my engineering study, I'm paying for it out of my replacement fund. So if it's out of the replacement fund, it must be capital, right? Right. Um, New Jersey doesn't look at it that way. So New Jersey doesn't really care if you have an engineering study, and they don't really care if you have a replacement fund for purposes of sales tax. So if the, if the items in the replacement fund, like let's say something like maybe clubhouse furniture or pool furniture or fitness equipment, a lot of times those items are expensive, and so the engineer puts it in the replacement fund so that the association can save for it over a period of time. But if you go back to one of my original slides, I said that for it to be a capital improvement, it has to be affixed to the property. So, you know, clubhouse furniture, pool furniture, fitness furniture, um, and fitness equipment, well, those things are not affixed to the property. So therefore, you know, it, it does, right away, it doesn't meet that test. So the fact that it's in the replacement fund doesn't right. have any impact. So even if I nail my table down, it doesn't help? <laughs> um, I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nail right. it down. Maybe if you put, you know, wet concrete and put it in a concrete <laughs> and it became something that's there forever and ever, but um, I wouldn't take the chance on something like that. But, okay. <laughs> good, okay. try. good try. That's what we say. That's a good, give it a good college try. Okay, so actually, um, just another question that came in. What about a new pond aerator? A what? I'm sorry. And, you know, a lot of these associations have ponds outside, a pond, fish pond or something like that, and they put in these aerators in the ponds. So it's something that's inside the, the pond itself. Is it, it depends upon whether it would be attached to the pond or whether, whether it's just sitting out there floating. If it's one that's just floating out there, um, I think the state would take the position that it is not a capital improvement. If it's something that's, you know, attached to the pond, it becomes part of the pond that... Uh, so, yeah, this is, 
it's kind of from what I'm hearing is it's, it floats on the pond. It floats. I would expect that the state would take the position that is not a capital improvement since okay. it's not permanently affixed to the to the real property. Okay. Again, that's one of the you know, the state has <clears throat> gives certain guidelines and certain things are are really not subject to interpretation. So that's one of those things. Okay. Any? Um, okay. I have another one. I just need to go through it, but you guys continue. I might come back to you about this. Okay. All right. All right. So hopefully we've kind of given some good examples of what's considered a uh, capital improvement and what's considered a repair and maintenance. So, um, you know, we, we gave those examples, and you can tell by even, you know, the couple questions already that um, have come in is, is there like a real good list? Is there something that we can, you know, check off or ask ourselves some questions so that we know? And it's really not always a clear determination. Um, and there's often disagreement between the New Jersey Division of Taxation and the taxpayer. Um, and, you know, this is, this is often a question. So, uh, Len, maybe you might have some more you want to add to that? Right. Unfortunately, there is no clear bright line test in New Jersey gives. Well, they, they do give certain examples, but the examples they give in their guidance is, is very straightforward. You know, it's a new roof, um, a new newly paved parking lot is a clear example of this capital improvement. So to, to stick with the parking lot, it, clearly if, you, if you're going to mill down and repave an entire parking lot, that's going to qualify as a, a tax exempt capital improvement. But say there's only one parking space that needs to be repaired and someone comes in and fills, fills the potholes in, fills the cracks in, that's clearly going to be a repair. Now what happens if it's three spaces that need to be completely milled down and repaired in a parking lot of 100 spaces? So you've essentially replaced 3% of your parking lot. That's likely still going to be considered to be a repair because it's, it's insignificant to the overall parking lot itself. Um, if someone had to come in and replace 90% of a parking lot, that looks and feels much more like a capital improvement. Um, and I, I think you could argue that it qualifies. You know, there, there's, unfortunately, there's no magical number, no magical line that the state gives you that says once you get past X percentage of improvement to a, a piece of property, that it's going to become a capital improvement. Um, See, it's interesting, though. I think, it, you know, giving those percentages, it kind of helps you to go back to um, did it did it make it better than original or did it just restore to its original condition? So if you only repair maybe three spots in the parking lot, well, did we make our parking lot better than it ever was? Right. No, you you didn't. But if you, I guess more of the question is if you actually milled it down, ripped mm -hmm. it out, and replaced it, I still think that three three parking spots out of a hundred probably isn't a capital improvement. Um, but, you know, 75% of that parking lot milled down and repaved, maybe you have a better argument. You probably do have a better argument. Made it new and you probably, better. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's really no bright line test. So, by the way, we just going back, we have another question that came in. Um, so somebody is asking, they redid their clubhouse entrance and parking lot to make it uh, handicap accessible. So the concrete vendor did not charge or place tax on the bill, but the electronic company that did the door to make it, you know, electronically open and also for the pool, uh, charged them sales tax on those two items, but they weren't charged the sales tax on the concrete. So should all three items have been subject to sales tax, do you think? Uh, I'm going to defer that question for a little while until Carol talks about completing the ST8 and why two of those items may have been charged sales tax, even though they're could have been a position that they were capital improvements. All right, very good. So I don't want to jump too far ahead in, in our presentation. Okay. Okay. But to stick with the concept that we're talking about, um, you know, another another important factor I find is, you know, in dealing with many New Jersey auditors over the years, they all have their own interpretations and perspective on what a capital improvement is or isn't. Again, because there's no clear guidance by the state, some are more generous in their interpretation. Some are very stringent in what may be a capital improvement. One thing that I do find is that the wording in the contract or the write-up of the work order can be very influential in their determination of whether or not it's a capital improvement. So I'm going to give you two examples that are essentially the same project and one is going to sound more like a capital improvement and one is going to sound like a repair. Um, so you'll, you'll kind of highlight, it'll highlight how you want the contract worded 
to make sure that you get the best position for a capital improvement. So one example is there's a, a break in a, in a pipe below the surface at an association, and that pipe needs to be repaired. So in order to repair that work, the, the contractor is going to have to come in and rip up the driveway and rip up the sidewalk, and they're going to go down, they're going to fix it, they're going to repair it, and they're going to repave over where they repaired everything. But essentially, the work order is calling for repair of a leaky pipe. And it was a significant amount of the driveway and, and walkway that had to be ripped up and, and repaved. Um, that sounds a heck of a lot like a repair, because the whole purpose of the job or the whole purpose of the work was to go down and repair a leaky pipe. So I, I think if an auditor comes in and reads that kind of language in a contract, they're going to look to assess tax on that as a repair. But let's look at another way we could have worded that. We're, we're going to hire a contractor to come in, repave a portion of the parking lot, repave a portion of the sidewalk, large enough that we feel it could be a capital improvement. And once they rip it up and mill it down, they're going to inspect the pipes underneath. And if anything needs to be fixed, they'll fix it at that point. But the main focus of the job was to repave the parking lot and the, the sidewalk. If an auditor reads that language, they're more likely to agree that that would be a capital improvement than one that focused on someone, someone having to come in to repair a burst pipe. Um, so the, the language in the contract or the work order is very important, especially in dealing with someone who's an auditor who's not a contractor, not an expert in this area, and they're just looking for certain key words. So if you feel that something's a capital improvement, you're going to want to review those contracts and make sure the contractor is avoiding words like repair, um, restore. You're going to want to focus on replacement, you know, new things, new um, driveway, new walkway. So you, you really have to be careful because that will those contracts and the wording of those contracts are very influential, influential in an auditor's determination of whether or not it's a capital improvement or repair. Do you think it makes a difference in the contract? So the example that you gave, the second example. So you're going to um, you know, redo the sidewalk, and you're going to mill it down, and then you're going to see about pipe. Now, would it matter? Should they be putting estimates of price for each aspect? Do you think that would have a difference? They, they could. They, would they that help or could. hurt? Or what do you what do you think about that? It, it would certainly help to the extent that the items we'd want to consider replacements are the, the lion's share of the cost of the project. And you know, in this example where they're going to be redoing a, a driveway and a walkway compared to repairing a pipe underneath the ground, the lion's share of the cost probably is in the driveway and the sidewalk, sidewalk work. Um, so I, I think it could only help the situation. Right. OK. That's good to know. And so when people are doing the contracts, it's probably a good thing to really go through that thoroughly. And if it's really large, you know, make sure that you've discussed it with somebody to make sure that you're you're complying. Yeah, that, that's something we look for when we are asked to review a contract to determine whether or not it could be a capital improvement is advising on what the wording should be to make sure that it, it'll be influential to an auditor that it makes it sound much more like a capital improvement. So we have a couple of quick examples just to highlight uh, capital improvement, one that, that is and one that's not. Um, ABC Condominium Inc. needs to replace the entire roof of its clubhouse. The contractor supplies all the materials for the job. Is this considered a capital improvement not subject to New Jersey sales tax? Here we have a clear example where they're replacing the entire roof. It's actually an example that New Jersey gives as an example capital improvement. Here there's no doubt that this is, qualifies as a capital improvement. Second example, the clubhouse roof of ABC condominium was damaged in a storm. Approximately 20% of the roof and shingles need to be replaced. The parts and materials will be supplied by the contractor. Can this project qualify as a tax against capital improvement? At 20%, probably not. Um, this probably would be viewed by the state as a repair or maintenance expense. Uh, the important thing to note here is because the parts and materials are being supplied by the contractor, you're going to want to ask that contractor to separately state their cost of the parts and materials so they don't have to charge you sales tax on that portion of the project at least. So there will be some level of savings. But overall, at 20% of replacing a roof, the state will most likely take the position that that is a repair. So, Mohammed, do you want to uh, take yeah. question number all two? All right. So we have num question number two to make sure that you guys are all listening. Uh, labor charges 
on all capital improvements are exempt from tax. True or false? All right, so we're going to close the voting now, and we have 72% that say true and 28% that say false. So what's the correct answer, guys? True. 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 Wow. So again, the labor charges, if it's a capital improvement, the labor charges are exempt from New Jersey. Oh, I'm sales. sorry. Actually, here, Carol, we, we got tricked ourselves. The answer here is actually false, and you're going to tell us why that's in a moment. Okay. Oh, on all because if they don't fill out? Nope. Nope. There are certain capital improvements oh, that are attached. Oh, so here we go. Okay. All right. We did a trick question in here and we, we <laughs> forgot ourselves. So labor charges in general are exempt from sales tax. For capital improvements. For capital improvements. But New Jersey has specifically identified certain capital improvements that are always subject to sales tax. And these things are landscaping, security systems, carpeting and other flooring, and painting and wallpaper, which are considered maintenance unless it's for a new construction. So for some reason, New Jersey has carved out these particular capital improvements. And you might think, you know, putting down carpet in a high-rise building on every single floor is certainly a capital improvement. Um, and it is affixed to the floor. That carpet's not coming up. But New Jersey has specifically carved that out, that it is subject to sales tax. And there is a good reason, Carol, why these, these services are subject to sales tax. It's because New Jersey needed to balance their budget in 2006. <laughs> and this is how they accomplished that, by expanding or by eliminating certain capital improvements that they wanted to tax. There you go. So a good reason. Makes a lot of sense. And who knows what's going to happen uh, in future years. Maybe something else will become subject to sales tax. So going back to that other polling question, just so that we're clear, labor charges on capital improvements that are not subject to sales tax. So any of the other capital improvements that we had talked about, those labor charges are not subject to sales tax. But if it's a capital improvement that is carved out, then the labor charge as well as the uh, part that's all subject to sales tax. All right, and just two items I just wanted to give a few examples on on this slide is one, landscaping. Um, you know, clearly planting trees and shrubs or planting lawns is going to be now a taxable capital improvement as of 2006. But I often get questions uh, on certain other things like hardscaping. Hardscapings are still exempt from sales tax. They're not considered to be landscaping. What's so whether it's pavers for a walkway or a deck or mm -hmm. something along those lines, you know, if, if it's hardscape, considered to be hardscape, that's still going to be an exempt capital improvement. So it's really going to mainly focus on your plantings, your lawns, your shrubs, your trees. And the other little tricky one is when you get into carpeting and other flooring, um, there are certain projects where you have to pay attention to because taking a bathroom, for example, you're going to be putting ceramic tile in a bathroom, perhaps, and it's going to be on the floor. It'll be on the walls of the shower. It may be on the sides of the bathtub. It may be on the walls of the, the bathroom. New Jersey only specifically taxes floor coverings applied to floors. So if you're using the same tile on the floor in addition to the walls, the shower, the bathtub, um, it's only anything applied to the floors that's taxable. So you're going to need that contractor to segregate their labor between the taxable portion of the service and the non-taxable portion of the service, as silly as that sounds. And then what about also the floor tiles? The floor tiles would be subject to tax. Yeah. Right, except for the their cost of the flooring tiles if they separately state that on the invoice. Right. The joys right. of living in New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> so this is another example where if it's something that's you know, a big job, don't just you know, just assume one way or the other. It's really important you take a look at it and see can you potentially save some sales tax um, if the contract is properly worded and if the invoices are properly stated. Uh, okay. 
we're going to jump forward a bit to get to the ST8, yep. and then we'll come back to those previous two slides. Okay. So an ST8 form. So okay, now we've discussed discussed what qualifies as a capital improvement. So therefore, um, not subject to sales tax and repair and maintenance. It is subject to sales tax. So how do we go about accomplishing that? You know, do we just say, okay, it's not subject to sales tax, so we don't have to pay it? And whose responsibility is it to figure all of this out? So the responsibility um, lies with the association. And the tax form that New Jersey has is the form ST-8, and it's called the Certificate of Exempt Capital Improvement. That's widely available. You can just Google it if you type in Form ST-8. We'll, we'll give the uh, references towards the end of the presentation. But if you were just go on the New Jersey website or just even go in and Google Form ST-8, New Jersey, it'll come up. And the association, the owner of the property, is the party that's responsible for completing the form. The association must sign the form, and the contractor must sign the form. Um, and then the contractor maintains this with their records as proof that this, this uh, project was not subject to sales tax. And it's important that the contractor has that because the contractor under the state law is required to collect sales tax on anything um, unless it's for some reason not subject to sales tax. So therefore the contractor must maintain this with their records as proof that they were not required to collect sales tax on this, um, this item. So why don't we jump back to the question Muhammad asked a few minutes ago. Do you want me to re-ask the question? So the question here was that uh, the clubhouse entrance and the parking lot were made handicap accessible. The concrete vendor did not uh, place tax on their bills, but the electronic company that, charged, that changed the two existing doors to make them automatic and installed electronic gate locks uh, in the existing pool gate did charge tax on their bills. So should sales tax have been charged on all three items or not? Uh, let's take the doors because I think the doors is a clear example. A, a new door, especially a new upgraded electronic door, would constitute a capital improvement based on the guidance New Jersey has given. But in order to be not, in order to not charge sales tax, the association would have needed to provide that vendor with a form ST8. If the vendor doesn't get an ST8, as Carol said, they are required to collect sales tax. So that means even though it may not have been subject, it was the association that should have taken the step and given them the ST8. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. That, the association, the, the vendor is going to collect sales tax. It's their obligation to collect sales tax. And um, so unless they receive this form ST8, they will have to charge sales tax. Absolutely. And many vendors will work with you and let you know that it is a capital improvement and ask for the STA, but you know not all vendors will do that for you, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the better ones will. Uh, and also with the new the new locks, those likely would also be considered a capital improvement, um, but we'd probably need a little more information to make that determination. Okay. So what about the concrete then? Remember there was three parts to it, so there was concrete work to make it handicap accessible? The, Putting in a, a concrete ramp would absolutely cap qualify as a capital improvement. So that's a capital improvement. Yeah, and may, maybe the ST8 was supplied to that vendor, or maybe they just took the position knowing it was a capital improvement. They weren't going to go through the hassle, but technically they are required to receive a ST8 uh, before, otherwise they have to charge sales tax. Okay. So the information that's needed on the ST8 form is not too difficult. <clears throat> So the name of the contractor, the address of the contractor, um, the contractor certificate of authority number, the address and the location where the work is being done, and the amount of the contract price. So that, that needs to be completed on the ST8 form. And again, that gets completed by the association. Go back a minute. That gets completed by the association. Um, they sign it, they give it to the contractor. Um, the contractor signs it, and everybody, both parties, should uh, maintain a copy of the of the ST8 form. And without that, the contractor really is obligated to collect the sales tax. Okay, so um, there's actually another question that did come in. Uh, one is, uh, is there a blanket ST8 option, or is it per invoice? 
But I think you might have answered that if you're saying that the contract price, so that means... It's, it's by, 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 uh, by project. By project. So you have, for each different project, you have right. an SDA form. Yeah. Right. And if, if one project, you know, you're saying project, but a project, let's say, could be, um, the work could be done by various vendors for one contract, each of the vendors you would need to provide the SDA form to. Correct. Okay, so um, I think you might have answered this, but I'm going to ask this. What happens if the association doesn't fill out the SDA form? Who is responsible for the tax? Well, the vendor should be charging the association for the sales tax. So they're, they're, they're obligations. So if they don't receive an SDA form, they're going to be charging sales tax. So, so the question might come up, well, what if it's, it was filled out, but it's not really a capital capital project. You're right. Yeah. What happens then? I mean, if you file, a, if you give an SD8 form to the contractor and the contract, contractor submits this to the state and then the state says, takes a position that this was not subject to sales tax, then what happens? Well, if the state determines, well, first, they're not really submitting it to the state. So what will happen is if they're under audit, they, they if the contractor um, is audited by the state of New Jersey and, and Sales and use tax audits, from what we've seen, are plentiful. Am I correct, Len? You've seen quite a number? Yeah, it, it happens quite often. Um, it, it definitely does. And you know, New Jersey often selects condominiums and co-ops because of the real property and the capital improvement aspect to the work being done, um, knowing that a lot of times th there's differences in interpretation of the rules and it's you know, where there's a, a building in place and there's a lot of work being done to the building, there's much more dollars to be gained by an audit of that type of entity than, you know, someone that owns a pizza shop for sales and use tax purposes or something like that where, you know, there, there aren't that level of dollars at work. So if, if a vendor is audited and, and they have an SDA form and they didn't collect the sales tax, but the state says, oh, no, no, this really, you know, sales tax should have been collected. It was not um, a capital improvement and it was a repair. Well, in that case, um, the, you know, as the vendor did collect the SDA and in good conscience they collected it and, you know, they, the association filled it out and they believed it to be true, um, the, the association would ultimately be responsible for that sales tax because it's their responsibility. So they would have to pay that. So it's just the, is it just the tax that they would have to pay at that point in time if it's later on, or is there anything else that they might be subject to? Well, New Jersey likes to assess interest and penalties. Oh, there we go. Yes, and interest and penalties could be quite significant. Sometimes that can be up to, we think it's like probably 25% of the, depending on how yeah, many years back. There can be late filing and payment penalties of up to 25%, and then interest adds up pretty quickly as well. So, so it's important you want to make sure that the SD8 forms are filled out. They're filled out correctly. Um, you're confident and you're feeling comfortable that, yes, this absolutely is a capital project. All right. Okay. Perfect. Well, I'm going to jump back a few slides. And now we're going to start talking about services or products the associations may charge to its unit owners. Uh, so the first one is in-unit repairs where, you know, a number of associations or co-ops will have maintenance crew on staff and they'll offer to they'll offer that maintenance person or people to the unit owners for hire if they have an in-house repair that they need to have made. And because this is considered a repair or maintenance service and not a capital improvement, where the association does is the labor charges would be subject to tax. Uh, parts and materials, just like with the association purchasing it, if they're separately stated on the, the invoice, you won't have to collect sales tax on that but the labor component is absolutely taxable as a repair or maintenance service. And again, that's because the parts and materials, the association paid the sales tax when they purchased it, Correct. right? Okay. So if you're holding any parts and materials for sale, this is probably less common, but um, if you're selling any tangible personal property directly that's not part of a repair or maintenance service, the association is going to need to charge sales tax on those on those the sale of those parts because they are tangible personal property subject to tax. Um, but the good news is, to the extent that you're holding inventory, the association could issue its 
vendor uh, form ST4 as a reseller because you only need to pay tax one time. So the association is going to be reselling these items to, to one of the unit owners. They don't have to pay tax when they purchase it. They have to collect tax though when they sell it to the unit owner. Should by chance the association issue an ST4 as a reseller and later use one of those items in inventory for its own purposes, they will become subject to use tax. So a few other transactions we want to consider and talk about is health and sports facility membership fees. Um, back when New Jersey decided to tax a few capital improvements, they also added a few different types of charges as taxable to generate some revenue. One was membership fees on health and sport, sports facilities. So where the association has a swimming pool or a golf club or a fitness center, and it's important to note that it's only if you charge a separate membership fee to utilize this premises that these are now subject to tax. If the cost of maintaining these is included as part of the maintenance fee that the unit owner pays each month. That You don't have to separately state this as part of the maintenance fee. If it's being assessed to all owners, it's not subject to tax at that point. This is only where there's a, a separate membership fee for use of the premises. I know this does happen in a number of associations, especially those with swimming pools and golf clubs. Um, one thing to note is it's only the membership fees that are taxable. Uh, if in New Jersey, for any participation sport fees that you're paying directly, you know, say for a yoga class or greens fees for a golf club, those are considered not subject to sales tax. What about like for a swimming pool? Most of the associations now <clears throat> swimming pools and they charge um, a fee just for to bring a guest in for the day to go swimming. Right. Guest fees are another item that are excluded from sales tax, so that's nice. Uh, also, season passes are excluded from from um, from <clears throat> from sales tax, and you know the season pass can't replace a membership fee. But it's say that every unit owner is going to pay ten dollars per each use of the pool, but they can pay a hundred dollars and use the pool unlimitedly over the course of the summer. That would be considered a season pass, where the only real gaining is a potential economic savings, not actual use of the facility. Other than what somebody else could use it. Okay, so if someone, if they just say, all right, if you want to use the pool for whatever, then you have to pay $100 for the year, it's not a matter of saying you buy one pass or another. Correct, exactly. Okay. So parking charges to non-members are also not now taxable. Um, Out-of-state internet purchases is a big use tax concern. Because um, as we said back in the beginning, vendors are not always required to collect sales tax from you. In order to collect sales tax, they have to have some physical presence in New Jersey. So if you're buying something on the internet from a company in Ohio, chances are they may not have nexus in New Jersey and be required to collect sales tax on behalf of New Jersey. All right, Len, you just used the tax word. Oh, come on, a lot of people <laughs> listening. You know, let's, let's just, uh, want to explain, you said if they have nexus. What the heck is so that? So what, what essentially all nexus means is that you have enough of a, a connection to a particular state to have to collect that tax or pay tax. Um, so I apologize for that. I did throw this word out interchangeably and don't think much see, about it. See, I told it. you you were the tax guru. See? <laughs> <laughs> um, but an out-of-state company often doesn't have this connection to the state to have to collect sales tax. So when an association purchases something on the internet from an out-of-state vendor um, where they don't collect sales tax on what would otherwise be a taxable purchase, you do have to pay use tax on that. Len, I actually want to go back a little bit and I have you clarify something. I don't know if you remember, uh, a couple of years ago, some associations that had storage areas were charging unit owners for using that storage area. And this was initially deemed to be subject to sales tax, and then later on it became not subject to sales tax, correct? Right. Th th this was a big disagreement we had with the state on one particular audit of a large co-op, um, where New Jersey now specifically tax storage for some storage space being sold where the, where the company is in the trader business of providing storage, where with an association or co-op, you know, as long as they're not providing this to the general public to come in and buy, they're just providing this as a courtesy or an ancillary product or service to their owners. 
they're not in the trade or business of selling storage to the public. Um, so for a condo or co-op that's only providing storage for a fee to its members, it's not going to be subject to sales tax. So this is something that we actually had and we got a letter from the state saying that it's not subject to sales tax, right? Well, the state, the state uh, on appeal, the state tried to assess sales tax and on appeal, they came back off of that and did not, right. they, they did not charge the sales tax. All right. Polling so question have, number three. We have our polling question number three here. Which which of the following are not subject to sales tax? Membership fees for the association's gym, parking charges to members, charges for in-unit repairs, all are taxable. What's the consensus, Mohammed? All right, I'm still waiting. We have about 55. Well, we're still moving. Give it a few more seconds here. Uh, all right, I think. So it, this is very interesting. It's split across the board here. <laughs> <laughs> we so, might have to clarify a couple things. Well, this is another trick question. So. All right, so we have 10% that think uh, uh, membership fees for the association gym, 35% parking charges for members, 10% charges for in-unit repairs, and 45% all are taxable. So, right. so B is the, the correct answer. Um, only parking charges to non-members are, in fact, taxable. So that's where it was a little tricky. We just talked about parking charges, but only for non-members. Parking charges to the members of the association or shareholders of the co-op are not taxable. Wow. That was a trick question. <laughs> we like to keep people on their feet, Muhammad. So let's talk a little bit about urban enterprise zones um, in the few minutes we have left. Um, this won't impact every every Sierra in New Jersey. It only um, impacts those in certain urban redevelopment areas. So what the state has done, they've identified certain areas that they want to give incentives to business owners to come in and actually occupy and do business in those areas. Uh, some examples of UEZs are going to be Newark, Camden, Trenton, New Brunswick, uh, Jersey City, and Asbury Park. There's 32 UEZs in total. Uh, we're going to give a link at the end of this presentation uh, to Urban Enterprise Zone Frequently Asked Questions, and that will give a, a full comprehensive list of all the different areas. So if you think you may be in a UEZ, um, this could be a great tax savings opportunity for you potentially. So one of the main benefits to a UEZ is an exemption from sales tax. And how do we get to that exemption? You have to be what's considered to be an urban enterprise zone qualified business. Um, one of the ways that you become qualified is to create new employment in the UEZ. 25% uh, of any new employees must meet, also meet a certain criteria that they're either located within the UEZ, they have to be unemployed for six months or more, or determined to be low-income individuals by the UEZ. And it's of note that each, each urban enterprise zone has their own person in charge of the UEZ, so they're all run a little differently. But the one thing I can tell you is that the person in charge of the UEZ tends to be one of the friendlier people I've ever dealt with at the state. They're all pretty friendly because their purpose for being there is just to help generate business for that zone. Um, and if nobody's coming into the zone, there's not much of a purpose for their job, so they, they want <laughs> to keep gainfully employed. Um, there is an alternate to new employees, which I think is what really comes into play for the, the condos and co-ops potentially, is that substantially contributing to the economic attractiveness to the UEZ. So constantly doing upkeep and repaving, putting in new sidewalks, landscaping, uh, a significant capital investment in the urban enterprise zone is another way to qualify. It's important to note that you're just not automatically an urban enterprise zone qualified business. You do have to apply to the UEZ for that status, and then you will get uh, sales tax exemption certificates, and we're going to talk about what some of those benefits are. So the sales tax exemption is for purchases of all tangible personal property that are going to be used within the urban enterprise zone. So that's a great tax savings, potentially, uh, with the exception of motor vehicles and energy. That's one carve out. Um, Purchase services are also exempt if performed at the CIRA location. 
So all your repairs and maintenance services would now become not subject to sales tax, another potential great savings. For UEZ sales tax collection, so this is where the CIRA is providing taxable services or taxable products to its owners. Uh, sales by UEZ business qualify for a 50% exemption on the sales tax for sales of tangible personal property. Um, does not apply for the sales of services. So no membership fees and unit repairs, you would still have to charge the full 7% sales tax on that. Uh, restaurant prepared foods also do not qualify for this. So if you have a, a catering site, uh, maybe a, you're providing some level of food or beverages on site, that wouldn't qualify either. I think some associations have yeah, restaurants on site, right? Yeah, have restaurants and do provide food services. As you can see, Len here has used the cells, which he likes to visit a lot. It's across <laughs> the street from our office, so. <laughs> it's actually where we're having lunch today from. <laughs> so and then just to talk about some common exemption forms, Carol covered Form ST8 for capital improvements pretty thoroughly. Hopefully everyone has a good feeling for that one now. Uh, sales for resale, you'd issue a ST3. That's where you're maintaining inventory to sell to the unit owners. Uh, that one's going to be less common for use in a CRO, I think. Uh, and UZ5 is the Urban Enterprise Zone exempt purchase certificate. So if you're in an urban enterprise zone as you're registered as a qualified business, that is the form that you're going to use to exempt your purchases from sales tax. And then we have a few resources that we wanted to provide everyone. The General Sales and Use Tax Guide, this is a great resource um, for determining what types of products and services are taxable or not taxable. Um, New Jersey Sales and Use Tax Guide for Contractors is probably the best guidance for trying to determine whether or not it's um, a capital improvement or not a capital improvement. Again, there's no bright line test, so you're going to be dealing with a lot of gray areas uh, if it's not something specifically identified by New Jersey. And we've mentioned the UEZ Frequently Asked Questions. That's a great resource if you are in a UEZ. It'll help you to get registered and we'll identify the urban enterprise zones if you think you may be in one and are not 100% sure. So just because you're in an urban enter enterprise zone doesn't automatically, you don't automatically qualify, right? Correct. You either have to create sure. employment or create a significant capital investment in the Right. So in the you make sure. Uh-huh. But they'll, they'll help you get there. Like I said, the UEZ coordinators are very friendly and very motivated to get new businesses signed up. Hi, sorry to interrupt you guys. And Carol, you want to tell them how to get the Form okay. ST8? <laughs> so just so that, as I said before, since the ST8 form should be your new best friend. Um, and you could just Google it or uh, just type in New Jersey Form ST8 and you'll be right there. And of course, here is, I put in the uh, website. So. All right. Uh, we had some questions that had come in. and I. Some of these relate to the ST8, actually. So I think we might have answered some of this, but I'm just going to put them out there. Um, what if no ST8 is filled out, but the contractor does not charge sales tax? Who is liable if audited? I think we mentioned that it is the contractor who's the, if they did not charge sales tax, but they did not get an ST8 either. Well, you know, the state says everyone's liable for the sales tax. So if the contractor gets audited and they didn't properly collect sales tax, the state could assess the sales tax on that. If it's actually the association that's being audited, mm -hmm. they will look to collect use tax from the association since they didn't pay sales tax at the point of sale. Essentially, the state will collect the money from whoever they can get it from. Okay. Okay. Um, can the uh, HOA property management company uh, fill out the estate on behalf of the association? Sure, they, they could absolutely complete that, but someone authorized does need to sign the form. So mm -hmm. if the management company or management representative is an authorized signer for them, they can sign it. Otherwise, a board member should be the signer of it. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, what if you paid sales tax on a capital improvement and now realize you shouldn't have? Uh, there, there is a mechanism where you could go back to the state of New Jersey to request a refund on that. Uh -huh. um, you can, you'd have to provide them with documentation as to what the actual improvement was let them know why it should not have been taxable and how it was ac they accidentally did not provide an ST8 and the contractor did charge sales tax. Uh, if that's from a specific person, or maybe we'll just email this form to everyone, I could email you a link to the form and some of the instructions for completing the refund request. Okay. 
Um, so remember, we had an example about um, the repair of underneath uh, concrete work or the pavement. So here they're asking, an example of that, of that in, in that situation, can they be two separate contracts? And then you have the repair of the pipe as one contract and doing the all the concrete or the paving work as a separate contract. And uh, would they, that be then? Could. Yeah. Sure. And then, using and then the paving yeah. is considered a capital improvement and the pipe is not. Yeah. Right. And it totally separates it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> now, uh, so one more question here. Um, is there a reasonability factor regarding use tax? In the state's eyes, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, you probably want to make a practical decision. And, you know, if you think you owe $50 of use tax every year, is it worth the headache of trying to comply with that? Mm -hmm. Knowing that if the state ever comes and looks at you, they're only going to collect a couple hundred dollars maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have to be a little practical here. But in the state's mind, there is no de minimis when it comes to paying over use tax. Okay. All right. All right, so I think uh, that's about it. That uh, wraps up our webinar for the day. Thank you so much, Len and Carol. You know, I listen to these, and even I learn a few things every time when I listen to them. So you're going to get a uh, form after this uh, to uh, give us uh, your feedback. Please do let us know if you have any other topics that you want to hear or if you think of any improvements. And any of the listeners, if you are a CPA, and if you need a CPE for this, the form is going to have a place that you need to check off uh, yeah, and then email it to uh, Sarah. And so uh, let us know if you do want CPE for it. Once again, thank you so much for listening and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.